Hello, everybody. Hope you're having a good week. Uh, it was a pretty day outside. Maybe you got out to play some a little bit today, and we're hopeful that uh, you're being good and doing well. We appreciate you coming to our class tonight so very, very much. Wish I could see you all, but it's just uh, not possible right now. But it's good we can be together like this. We can sing some songs and worship God and maybe have a little bit of fun together as we learn something about God's Word. We'll give it a few minutes for people to uh, be continuing to log on. And while we do that, let's just sing a couple of songs for those who are already here. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, Bible. That's right. Now let's sing, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. All right. Now we got, uh, let's do a couple of new songs this week. Uh, ones that we haven't done here anyway. I think you know them from your regular Bible classes. Roll the Gospel Chariot. Roll the gospel chariot along, roll the gospel chariot along, roll the gospel chariot along, and we won't tag along behind. If a brother's in the way, we will stop and pick him up. If a brother's in the way, we will stop and pick him up. If a brother's in the way, we will stop and pick him up, and we won't tag along behind. If a sister's in the way, we will stop and pick her up. If a sister's in the way, we will stop and pick her up. If a sister's in the way, we will stop and pick her up, and we won't tag along behind. If a sinner's in the way, we will stop and pick him up. If a sinner's in the way, we will stop and pick him up. If a sinner's in the way, we will stop and pick him up, and we won't tag along behind. But if the devil's in the way, we will run right over him. If the devil's in the way, we will run right over him. If the devil's in the way, we will run right over him, and we won't tag along behind. That's a good song, isn't it? I like that song. Now, uh, here's another song that we haven't sung, but I want to sing it because we were learning something about one big, one little word in it last week. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. I have the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I have the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And then here's a tongue twister. Do you know this one? I've got the wonderful love of my blessed Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Way down in the depths of my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my blessed Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Down in the depths of my heart to stay. And if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. Ouch! Sit on attack. Ouch! Sit on attack. And if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. Ouch! Sit on attack to stay. Remember what joy stands for? Jesus first, others second, and you last. Remember that, and you'll be happy. Now let's sing the books of the New Testament song. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and a letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Ah, oh, very good, very good. That helps us know what order the books of the New Testament come in. Sometime we'll learn the books of the Old Testament. And you probably already know them, but we'll work on them in this class sometime. All right, let's do the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up. The rains came down, and the floods came up, and the house on the rock stood firm. But the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. 
foolish man built his house upon the sand and the rains came tumbling down oh the rains came down and the floods came up the rains came down and the floods came up the rains came down and the floods came up but the house on the, and the house on the sand went splat that's right so build your house on the lord jesus christ so build your house on the lord jesus christ so build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings will come down. Oh, the blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. The blessings come down as the prayers go up. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. Very good, very good. Day one, day one, God made light when there was none. Day one, day one, God made light when there was none. Day two, day two, God made the sea and sky of blue. Day two, day two, God made the sea and sky of blue. Day three, day three, God made the land and flowers and trees. Day three, day three, God made the land and flowers and trees. Day four, day four, sun and moon and stars galore. Day four, day four, sun and moon and stars galore. Day five, day five, God made the birds and fish alive. Day five, day five, God made the birds and fish alive. Six day, six day, God made beasts and man that day. Six day, six day, God made beasts and man that day. Day seven, day seven, God rested in his heaven. Day seven, day seven, God rested in his heaven. All right, we know the books of, or the day, we know the books of the New Testament. We know the days of creation. We're learning all kinds of stuff, aren't, aren't we? Now, here's another one I want to sing tonight because it has to do with our lesson. Let's sing. It has the same tune as one we sang before, but it names the 12 apostles. You probably know it already. Jesus called them one by one. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Next came Philip, Thomas, too. Matthew and Bartholomew. James, the one they called the less. Simon, also Thaddeus. The 12th apostle Judas made. Jesus was by him betrayed. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. Yes, Jesus called them. And they all followed him. That's going to be our lesson tonight in just a minute. But first, let's get ready for Bible class. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. For God loves you, and I love you, and your teacher loves you, too. When you go to class, your teacher will tell you all that God has done for you. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. For God loves you, and I love you, and your teacher loves you, too. When you go to class, your teacher will tell you all that God has done for you. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. Boys and girls in your Bible class, be very, 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 very quiet. All right, now let's go through our card a little bit. Let's try to remember what all is on that card so we can remember where things are in the Bible. Starting in the Old Testament, who could tell me the chapter of the Bible where you would find the account of creation? I hope you said Genesis 1 because that's where it is. Who could tell me without looking at your card now because you're supposed to be working on these during the day and memorizing them. You know, you can go to your mom and dad and say, Mom, Dad, help me memorize these cards. That'd be good. So in Genesis 6 and 7, what takes place? Do you remember? Remember what takes place in Genesis 6 and 7? The great flood of Noah. The whole world was flooded, but Noah and his family were saved. And then who could tell me what chapter I would find Sodom and Gomorrah? Genesis 19. That's correct. I'm still going in order now to make it easy on you, but you try not to look at your cards, okay? Now, who, who could tell me what chapter I would find Joseph being sold by his brothers? Genesis chapter 37. That's right. And then in the book of Exodus, we got some things to remember. Who could tell me what chapters in Exodus I would find the 10 plagues? Exodus 7 through 12. Now, let's remember the 10 plagues. You shall have no other gods before me. Say them with me now. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. Those are the Ten Commandments. Oh, we forgot to mention the Ten Plagues, didn't we? The Ten Plagues are water to blood, frogs, lice, flies, cows got sick and died, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and death of the firstborn. Now, I forgot to ask you, where is the chapter where I can find the Ten Commandments? That's in Exodus chapter 20. That's exactly right. Now then, we move on a little bit in the Bible to the book of 1 Samuel. Who could tell me whose story is in 1 Samuel chapter 1? Uh, it's a girl's name. Happens to be the same name as my daughter. It's Hannah. That's right. First Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And who could tell me what chapter in 1 Samuel David beats big old Goliath by God's power? 1 Samuel chapter 17. And who could tell me what chapter of the Bible has Naaman in it? Naaman being healed of his leprosy. That's 2 Kings chapter 5. That's correct. And then who could tell me where the Sermon on the Mount is found? The Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew, three chapters, chapters 5, 6, and 7. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. One of those chapters has the model prayer in it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Where is that? Matthew chapter 6. And then that gets us to tonight's topic. Where will we find the account, the list of the 12 apostles? Well, on our card, it's Matthew 10. It's also in Mark chapter 3, and it's also in Luke chapter 6, and it's also in Acts chapter 1, without Judas, who betrayed Jesus. Now, those apostles were very, very important people. Jesus, you see, had come to this earth to die for our sins, and then he was going to be resurrected from the dead and go back to heaven. But he needed somebody to take his message out to all the people all over the world. How would you change the whole world? How would you get a message to the whole world? Well, today we do it like this. You can get on Facebook Live, and you can go to you can invite all your friends and everybody to come out. But they didn't have Facebook Live back then, and they didn't have computers, and they didn't have TV, and they didn't have radio. How is Jesus going to get his message? to the whole world. Well, he does it in a very amazingly simple way. You don't realize how simple this is or how hard it would be without God's power. It just couldn't be done without God's power. What Jesus did was first towards the beginning of his ministry, towards his, the beginning of his three years of preaching on this earth, he prayed all night, Luke chapter six says, and then in the morning he called his apostles to him his disciples that he called apostles and there were 12 of them and those apostles were the ones who were given power to heal people to cast out demons and they were given the authority to preach and he told them to go preach at first he told them in matthew 10 just to go to israel just to go to that one nation his own people to preach that's sometimes called the limited commission but then after he rose from the dead and met with his disciples as a resurrected Jesus, he told them, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, verse 16, 15 and 16. Or the way he said it in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20 was, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And do you know that those guys went all over the world preaching the gospel? We don't know everything that happened to them from the Bible. History tells us a lot of things, but we know from the Bible that Peter preached a first gospel sermon on Act, in Acts chapter 2. He got up and told that crowd of people just a few weeks ago, you crucified Christ, but now he's resurrected from the dead, and he's in heaven with God, and now you need to listen to him, and you need to obey him. And 3,000 of them did that day. And that was amazing for Peter to do that, because before that, he'd been kind of wishy-washy. He wouldn't stand up for certain things, but now he's really standing up for Christ. Do you know where he got that power? He got that power from God. God gave him that power because he was doing God's will. God then sent those 12 apostles out. 
and they taught other people and those people taught other people and those people taught other people and those people taught other people all about Jesus. So the world was changed and people started to know love like they'd never known love before. People started to know sacrifice like they'd never known sacrifice before. People started to treat each other a little bit better. Oh, it didn't get perfect. No, no, no. But Jesus changed the world for the good. And those 12 apostles got the message out. Let's sing their song again. Jesus called them one by one, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Next came Philip, Thomas, too, Matthew, and Bartholomew. James, the one they called the less, Simon, also Thaddeus. The twelfth apostle Judas made, Jesus was by him betrayed. Now you know the twelve apostles if you know that song. And you know God worked through them to take the gospel into all the world. I'm not an apostle. You're not an apostle. We're not special like that. But we are special because, do you remember Do you remember why? Because we're created in the image of God. Let's sing that song and then we'll have our prayer. Do you know, little child, what is in you? Can you dream, little child, of going far? Do you know, little child, of the power you've been given? Do you know, little child, whose you are? You were made in the image, in the image of God, just a little bit below the angels. And the masterpiece of heaven's hand is your body and your soul. You were made in the image, you were made in the image, you were made in the image of God, in the image of God. Oh, I hope you always remember that. You're so special because you were made in God's image. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for each of these children watching tonight. We pray you'll bless them, give them health and well-being and safety. Help them to be good for their parents and help them to be good to each other, kind and loving. Help them to put Jesus first and others second and themselves last like we all ought to do. And we pray that you'll bless their parents as they try to take good care of them and teach them in the ways that they need to know for good living in the ways that they need to know for life with Jesus. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Thank you, young people, for watching tonight. and Thank you, parents, for watching very much as well. I'm going to transition now into the teen and adult class, and we'll discuss the last of the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. It's a Beatitude that really takes three verses. You might remember that we've been studying the Beatitudes uh, because, well, there's, there's such important attitudes for us to have in order to be happy. That's what the word blessed means. And these Beatitudes often, well, they always represent the opposite of what the world would want us to do. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But the world doesn't want us to be poor in spirit. They want us to be prideful. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's okay to mourn and weep over sin even though the world wants us to just be giddy and happy all the time. Now, it's not good to be sad all the time. A merry heart does good like medicine, the Bible says. But we can mourn over sin sometimes. And if we do mourn, God says, well, we'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The world doesn't want us to be meek. The world wants us to be proud and strong and forceful. But we can be strong and still be kind, and that's called being meek. And then, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. The hungering and thirsting that we do for food is good because it helps us to remember to feed our bodies the nutrients that it needs, but we need to remember to hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's where real life is. And then blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The people who don't give mercy aren't going to have mercy given to them. Uh, mercy triumphs over judgment. James chapter 2, verse 13 says, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, that verse says also. And then Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The world doesn't want us to be that pure. They show us kind of things all the time that want us to make us impure. But God wants us to be pure, and we'll be blessed if we are. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The world likes division. We see a lot of division right now. The world likes division, and the world, Satan likes to divide people and get them fighting against one another, especially in the church. But Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, the next beatitude is three verses long.
it's an unpleasant one. It's not one that's very nice to think about all that much, really. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets before you. I don't like to talk about persecution a lot, although it seems like I've preached on it recently, and I apologize if some of this is a little bit redundant to some of you that were meeting with us at Hillview while we were still meeting there. But in the context of the Beatitudes, maybe we'll see some new things. The persecution of Christians is a very real thing, and I don't like to talk about it all that much. Uh, I'm a slow learner, and I used to talk about it more plainly and openly than I did. I realized that maybe there are some things that don't need to be said out loud. Uh, there are a lot of World War II veterans that don't talk about all of the horrible things that they saw because they just don't need to be said out loud in polite company. There are a lot of things that go on over the world, and there's persecution all over the world, even still today. And it's sad. We hate it. We don't want it to be there, but it is there. Jesus said here, but you're going to expect it. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There are reasons that people are persecuted that are set out there first in that first verse in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. There are righteous people who are persecuted. To be righteous means to be right and to treat other people rightly. And in a world of people that love the wrong and love to treat other people wrongly, they're going to hate righteous people. But when righteous people stand up and are known, they're going to be persecuted from one side or another. They're going to be persecuted from all sides, perhaps. People will misunderstand them. People will say bad things about them. Some people might even hurt them and turn to violence on them. So we want to understand that persecution comes because of righteousness. Persecution comes sometimes just because our behavior is unappreciated. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, through which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Just by doing what was right, he condemned the world. Now, 2 Peter 2, verse 5 also tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So he would have been preaching to people to repent during this time as well. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 it reminds us that just by doing what is right, some people are going to be offended. He condemned the world just by doing what was right. Can you imagine people walking by? What are you building there, Noah? Well, I'm building an ark. Why? The world's going to be flooded. Why is the world going to be flooded? Because of sin. Well, am I in sin? No. Well, I have to say you are. And people would be offended by that, you see. And so they might lash out against Noah. Doesn't appear a lot of people obeyed him. Just his family, just his family and their his sons and their just his wife and his sons and their wives were the only ones who were saved. And everybody else disobeyed. So he might have taken a lot of mockery and a lot of hatred from people. And then sometimes Christians, righteous people, have to speak up about things that are going on that are wrong. And that's going to really cause people to hate them. There's a command in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. That is to say, we're not going to just stand aside and let things take place without saying these things are wrong. When we say these things are wrong, people will get really upset because they might be participating in things that are wrong or they might approve of people that are participating in things that are wrong. And so they'll become real upset with people who are trying to be Christians, who are trying to tell them that you need to change your ways so that you can be right with God and have an eternity with him. People, unfortunately, will not like us for that all that much. But Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now think about that throughout the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The world's not going to like humble people a lot. Blessed are those who mourn. Well, the world likes you more if you're fun and happy to be around. And blessed are the meek. Well, the world doesn't like you to be meek. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The world doesn't like righteousness, so they're certainly not going to like those who practice righteousness and hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
the world's not going to like merciful people all that much unless those merciful people are having mercy on those very people that are accusing them of things. And the world's not going to like pure people because the world loves to peddle impurity. The world's not going to like peacemakers a lot. They'd rather have somebody that divides and conquers. Well, I have a friend that uh, a while back told me that he observed that these two pair, these two beatitudes were right together and maybe just for a reason. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And then blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. His observation, and uh, maybe he's listening tonight, I don't know. His observation was that sometimes he's tried to be a peacemaker and ended up having both sides, for which he was trying to make peace, turn on him and be angry at him. Sometimes when you try to make peace with people, they take it wrong and they turn on you. Maybe that's why those two parables are together. Well, there are Christians in this world, none of whom are perfect, but who try to do right and try to do well, and that they're going to try to be peacemakers. They're going to try to follow Jesus' commands in the Beatitudes and everywhere else in the Scriptures. But the world's not going to like them for it. And then there's another thought that occurs to me here. He says, not only, he really doesn't say, blessed are the righteous, those who are persecuted because they're righteous. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. You know, it's very possible that people are imperfect and maybe even not saved, but they're still standing up for a good cause. They're still standing up for a righteous cause. And if they're standing up for a righteous cause, the world is going to hate them just as much as if they were Christians, if they were saved people. And sometimes we need to consider that a little bit. The, um, the analogy that I think of is, once again, World War II. In World War II, there were the Nazis who just had a horrible worldview that they were the chosen race and they had the right to exterminate everybody else. And then there were other people who fought them. But would I say or would anybody say that those other people who fought them were perfect people? No, there was a lot of drunkenness among soldiers. There might have been gambling among soldiers. There might have been sexual immorality among the soldiers. I wouldn't say they were perfect by a long shot. But still, they were standing up for a better cause than the Nazis were. And then some people might do that in our world at different times and be persecuted for righteousness sake, even though they're not particularly righteous themselves. I wonder if that's a thought that might have been in Jesus' mind here. I just throw it out there for you to consider. But well, when we're persecuted, then we understand what it means to be persecuted because Jesus said, oh, the world's going to hate you to his apostles. Jesus is speaking to his apostles in John 14, 15 and 16 on the night before his death. And he's telling them, I'm leaving you. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be helping you. But the world is going to treat you just like it's treating me. He says in John 15, verses 18 and 19, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Those are some pretty sobering words to hear. I like to be liked, but a lot of people are going to hate me just if I try to be righteous and if I try to stand for something for righteousness sake. And then Jesus said in John chapter 16, verses 1 and 2 to those same disciples, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. That was the Jewish place of worship. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Now, those words were spoken specifically to the apostles, yet they've come true for a lot of other people throughout the ages. As a matter of fact, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Paul said, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's well, a sobering thought. And sometimes we need to remember it because we won't be surprised then when people have something to say against us. In verse 11, Jesus goes on to explain this a little bit more. He says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. There's some gain to be had in studying these original words right here. To revile someone in the original word meant to insult them. Look at some other contexts. Jesus, in Matthew 11, verse 20, reviled some people, although the word is translated in English, rebuked there, but they deserved it. 
Jesus was doing the right thing, of course. In Matthew 11, verse 20, he said, then it says, then he began, that is, Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Jesus is reviling them or rebuking them for not repenting. Now, in English, revile has more of an insulting, devilish connotation. So that's probably why we have the English word rebuke translated there. They didn't repent when they had the chance. He taught them, showed them mighty works. They didn't repent, and so he rebuked them. Well, people will rebuke us, revile us, for trying to do what's right. There's always going to be this clash of worldviews. There's always going to be this clash of, I want to do evil. Well, you're doing good. And there's going to be that clash right there. Hopefully it doesn't turn violent, although unfortunately it does from time to time. And then in Mark chapter 16, verse 14, the Bible says, Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He rebuked the apostles for not believing at some point. He's reviling them in that regard. Now, the difference is that when you have a rebuke from people who are doing false things and wrong things toward people who are doing right things, that's different than Jesus rebuking those people who did wrong things. He's the rightness, he's the righteousness, and they're doing wrong things. Now then, here's another difference. Sometimes people might revile us and their charges are simply false or in mockery. Indeed, if we're living righteous lives and they revile us, then their charges really don't make any sense. They're, there's nothing to them. They're false. They're, they're out of line. Remember the criminals on the cross, the robbers that were crucified Jesus, with Jesus reviled him. Mark chapter 15, verse 32, and Matthew chapter 27, verse 4. And then in Romans chapter 15, verse 3, the apostle Paul writes, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. That's a quotation from Psalm 69, verse 9 about Jesus. The reproaches or the revilings of those who reproached you fell on me. Well, the reproaches of those who reproached Jesus fall on the disciples to some degree. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. An example of reviling is in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 18. Jeremiah was the one guy standing up for righteousness in his generation, and he took it on the chin for it a lot. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 18, the people plotted a plan. They said, come, let us devise plans against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor the word from the prophet, nor the counsel from the wise. Come and let us attack him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. What they wanted to do was discredit his character, lie about him, revile him, so that then people wouldn't believe him. Even if he did tell the truth, if they could attack his character, then they wouldn't believe him if he told the truth. That's reviling, and it's sad that that happens, but it happens sometimes to people who are trying to do what is right. And then the word persecute. I didn't realize this till studying for this lesson. The word persecute is a word from a word that means to make someone flee or to make someone run. Then, so what you're doing is somebody's standing in a particular position and you're doing something to scare them to make them run away. That's the physical meaning of it. And then the metaphorical meaning was they have some sort of particular position they're holding to, but you're trying to get them to not take that position anymore. You're give, trying to give them reason to be afraid. And then in the context of Christianity, it was that they're holding to the doctrine of a risen Christ. They're holding to the doctrine of the church. They're holding to the doctrine of the authority of God. And people don't want them holding to that, so they persecute them to try to get them to abandon those particular beliefs, those particular principles, and those particular holdings. Well, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, you can see how the word means this. Verse 34, rather. Jesus says, therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. You see that? Persecute from city to city. Now, what it probably means is that they go to one city and persecute people, and then they go to another city and persecute people. But then also there were occasions when the people actually ran because of persecution. In Acts chapter 8 and 9, when they run because of Saul's persecution, they scatter from Jerusalem because they don't want to be persecuted. 
And so they're getting out of there so that they can save their lives. Well, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, when Jesus is sending the disciples on the limited commission, he, he tells them, he warns them this, and he gives them instruction. When they persecute you, that's the warning, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you shall not have gone through all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. You just keep running from them. They're persecuting you. Don't you abandon your principles. Don't you abandon what you know is right and what you know is true. But if you need to flee from city to city, okay, do that. So the word persecute means to make flee. And we're not talking so much about making people flee physically, but making people flee spiritually. It's used in a good context in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, when Paul says, But you, O man of God, flee these things. That is the temptation mentioned before, the temptation for the love of money and so forth. Flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. You flee these things. Let those things persecute you right out of having any desire for them, those lusts of the world. You let them persecute you out. But don't let unrighteous people persecute you away from your righteousness. When Saul was on the road to Damascus, the Lord said to him, why do you persecute me, Saul? Saul was actually trying to move the Lord out of his position in a way of thinking in that regard. In Acts chapter 22, verse 4, Paul said of his former life, I persecuted this way to the death binding and delivering into prisons, both men and women. I persecuted it. I made these people flee, and I tried to make them flee from their Christianity so much and so far that I would put them to death, and they would die before they would flee from their Christianity, before they would allow persecution to get them. And then some people will do this. Some people will persecute in order to validate themselves. They did the same thing to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 11, verse 19. He says, but I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter and did not know that they had devised schemes against me saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. You see, Jeremiah was the tree. His sayings of truth were the fruit. Let us destroy the tree with its fruit and let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name may be remembered no more. Let's just kill him. That's what they wanted to do to Jeremiah, just because he was speaking righteousness. They wanted him to flee from his righteousness. He wouldn't do it, so they were going to take care of matters themselves, they thought. And Jesus, in John chapter 15, verse 20, says to the apostles, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So blessed are you when men shall revile you that is, say bad things about you, persecute you, try to get you to flee from what you're holding to in Christianity. And when they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Have you ever had somebody lie about you? You ever had somebody tell an untruth about you that harmed you? Well, there are plenty of examples in the Bible of people that did. You remember the story of Naboth, had a vineyard next to the king's. King Ahab wanted that vineyard, but Naboth wouldn't sell it to him out of conscience because it was one that had been passed down to his family for a long, long time. Jezebel, Ahab's wife, said, man up, we can get this. So she wrote letters, said, bring Naboth to a banquet, and then set up two scoundrels to bear witness against him and say that he's blasphemed against God. They did. Those scoundrels falsely testified against him. Naboth didn't blaspheme God. You know, he didn't live through that incident. They killed him for blaspheming God. Sometimes in this old sad world, people die because of lies told about them. Blessed are you when they shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. In Acts chapter 26, verses 24 and 25, Paul is talking about his conversion to the Roman governor Festus and King Agrippa and some other nobles that were gathered there. When Paul gets to the point of his conversion and talking about that light on the road to Damascus and everything else that happened in that circumstance, Festus just gets upset and bursts out. Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Paul, you're crazy is what they're saying. 
Well, they said the same sorts of things about Jesus. And they even said that Jesus cast out demons by the power of the devil. They said Jesus, uh, they said things along the line of Jesus being out of his mind. And they were lying. Paul said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. Paul did something that a lot of us might not have the strength to do, at least by ourselves. I haven't had the strength to do it and needed to grow and still need to grow. Paul blessed those who persecuted him. He blessed and did not curse, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 14. And then in Jeremiah chapter 37, another great passage, sad passage, but a powerful passage. Jeremiah is speaking to Zedekiah, who was the last king of Judah before Jude, Jerusalem would be taken captive. And Zedekiah is really not all that uh, keen on Jeremiah. They have some discussions, and Jeremiah ends up telling him that he's going to be delivered to the Babylonians. Here's what happens first, starting at Jeremiah 37, verse 11. And it happened when the army of the Chaldeans left the siege of Jerusalem for fear of Pharaoh's army, that Jeremiah went out of Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin to claim his property there among the people. So Jeremiah was going out. The Chaldeans, the Babylonians, had surrounded Jerusalem, and then they left for a little bit because Pharaoh was coming up from Egypt, and they had a little bit of fear of that, so they left. And when that happened, there was a little bit of lag in the security, you might say. So Jeremiah decides to leave to go to the property of Benjamin and proclaim some property or claim some property that he had purchased. Well, here's what people say about him in verse 13. And when he was in the gate of Benjamin, a captain of the guard was there, whose name was Elijah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah. And he seized Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, you are defecting to the Chaldeans. You're a traitor, Jeremiah. You're leaving us and you're going to the Chaldeans. Why are you leaving town? Well, because you're going over to the Babylonians. That's why. Then Jeremiah said, false. I'm not defecting to the Chaldeans. He wasn't. That wasn't true at all. But he did not listen to him. So Elijah seized Jeremiah and brought him to the princes. And therefore the princes were angry with Jeremiah. and They struck him and put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for they had made that the prison. And it wasn't a great prison. Verse 16, when Jeremiah entered the dungeon and the cells and Jeremiah remained there many days, then Zedekiah came and talked to him after a while. You see, Jeremiah was just going out to do something innocent. But since they hated him so much, they used the opportunity to say, you're a traitor and you're leaving and we're going to put you in prison for it. Jesus says, blessed are you when men say all kinds of evil things against you falsely for my sake. Then it happened to the early Christians as well. I think you know that some of the early Christians were called haters, people who hate society because they were disrupting the pagan society and the pleasures that people had by just living righteously. They weren't demanding other people live righteously. They were just preaching the gospel of Christ. But when people heard that gospel, they were pricked in their hearts, and instead of obeying, they would take it out on the Christians, and they called them haters of society. And they called the early Christians cannibals because they heard that they were partaking of Jesus' body and blood in the Lord's Supper. They misunderstood that. You know how rumors get going. And so they came to the determination that Christians were cannibalistic, eating human flesh and drinking human blood. It was false. It was a lie. But that's what people said. And they even said that early Christians were incestuous because they called themselves a family and they called themselves brother and sister. And you might be married to someone, but and perfectly legally and morally so, but you call her your sister in Christ and they'd take that and run with it and say, oh, no, you're committing a horrible sin. They lied about early Christians in that regard. Jesus says, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. How can you feel blessed in such a circumstance? He explains in verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You can rejoice that you're in good company, in good company with people like Jeremiah, in good company with people like Isaiah, whom tradition says was sawed in two because of his proclamation of the prophecies of God. You're in good company with those people that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11, 
as having gone to prison, being in dungeons, being stoned, being beaten. None of us want that for anyone. But they endured it because they knew they had a better reward, the text says. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then you're in the company of Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, Peter writes, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. Christ didn't retaliate against people. And then in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, Paul said, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in his name, but also to suffer for his sake. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, Peter writes, Therefore, since Christ also suffered in the flesh for us, let us arm ourselves with this same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. It's a pretty good indication that you're not living a lifestyle of sin if you're suffering because people are persecuting you for righteousness like they persecuted Christ. And then you might remember what was said a little bit later in that chapter, 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 14. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when he is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. In the end, what matters is that Christ is glorified. Some of these people were persecuted long and hard and long before Jesus got here. Remember Stephen, at the end of his sermon, says to those people who are about to stone him to death, which of the fathers did your prophets not persecute? And they prophesied or they foretold the coming of the just one, Jesus, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. He said a few more words to them before they picked up rocks and stoned him to death. When we're persecuted for righteousness sake, we're in good company of good people who stood their ground in much more drastic situations than many of us, most of us have faced. And then we might remember that there's a response to this as well. Let me go back to Jeremiah for the response. In Jeremiah chapter 20, there's a verse in Jeremiah chapter 20 that a lot of preachers are required to memorize. It's verse 9, where Jeremiah says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him any more, nor speak in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Jeremiah got to the point that he said, I'm not going to speak anymore in, Christ, in, in God's name. It's just not worth it. But then the righteousness within him just burned so much that he had to speak. Now watch the verses around it, before and after it, and get the whole context. Starting in verse 7. Oh Lord, you induced me and I was persuade, persuaded. You are stronger than I, and I have prevailed. He means, God, you told me I was getting into this, and you had me get into this. You prevailed. You won. I'm, I'm into this prophecy business. mocks me he's almost complaining a little bit to god there you might say there are some troubling passages in jeremiah where he complains a little bit to god about why he had to go through this and sometimes god is very compassionate with him other times god says you just need to be manly about this he almost seems like he's complaining a little bit maybe he's just stating a fact i'm in derision daily everybody mocks me all they do is make fun of me for when I spoke, I cried out, I shouted violence and plunder, because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. He was talking about the violence and plunder that they were committing in Jerusalem that was evil, perhaps. Or maybe he was talking about the violence and plunder that was coming upon them from the Babylonians in judgment of their evil. I don't know. But when he says that, he says, my word, God, or the word that I was speaking, God's word was made a reproach and a derision to me daily. How many people that are listening right now probably go to work when you can go to work and you're around people who mock you and ridicule you because you hold to Christian principles and you won't go to that office party and you won't take part in that raffle and you won't do this thing and you won't do that thing. God's word is a reproach and a derision daily. 
It's at that point that he says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. For I heard many mocking, saying, Fear on every side. You see what they're saying? Jeremiah, you're just paranoid. You say we're going to be taken over by the Babylonians. Oh, you're just paranoid. You're just a naysayer. You're just a paranoid man. Fear on every side. That's what they said about him. They also said, report, they say, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watched for my stumbling. That's what they were doing. Perhaps he can be induced. Then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. They were trying to trap him, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians tried to trap Jesus in arguments. They were trying to trap Jeremiah so that they could get him and legally arrest him and do something to him, maybe even kill him. They were trying to catch him in a trap. Watch him. Watch his steps closely. Don't let him slip up. If he slips up, you let us know. We'll report it. We'll get that man. But then, in verse 11, here's what he says. After almost complaining, after almost holding God's word in, he finally comes to this poignant and powerful resolution. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten not going in. My persecutors will not prevail. No persecutors of God's people ever win. None of them ever prevail. We're not talking about the people who mocked and ridiculed Jeremiah. We don't even know their names. Jeremiah lived a rough 40 years of adulthood on this earth and more perhaps. But you know, from all we can expect of God's word, he's been resting ever since, which would be to us some 2,500 years. Persecutors never win in the long run. We don't like it that they didn't repent and obey God, but we can take a little bit of solace in the fact that justice will be done in the end, in the end of that situation and in the end time in the last day. Yet, we're supposed to be people who don't lash out, don't lash back at them. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 12, when we labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. I've made this comment before to some others recently, but I'll make it here again. I don't think that it's a wise thing for us to pray for persecution. I know Jesus said it will come. I know there's a movement among some in churches that says, well, if we had some real persecution in this country, if we had some real violence against us or something like that, then it might embolden the church and we might be more faithful. We might appreciate things a little bit more. And I see where they're coming from. But all I see in the Bible is people praying to be strong in persecution. Paul didn't pray particularly to get out of it when he was in it. But I also see those Christians in Jerusalem scattering when persecution started. Why well, put your family through that if you don't have to? There are Christians all over the world today, or maybe not New Testament Christians the way we know them, but people who claim Christ who are standing up for righteousness sake in some regard, and they're being hurt, they're in labor camps, and they're tortured, and they're praying awfully hard to get out of persecution. I don't want anybody to be persecuted. I'm not going to pray that for my friends, my family, my children. That's just my opinion. You can take it for what it's worth. I pray that freedom spreads all over the world and that we can preach the gospel freely like we've been able to do so for so long from this country, even though this country had a whole lot of problems and were quite imperfect in some regards. I pray for freedom to spread so that the gospel can have free course. We know this, though. That in the end, persecutors will not prevail. Righteous people will. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets before you. Just a few verses as we wrap up our time today. First of all, from Proverbs 20, verse 22. 
Do not say, I will recompense evil. Wait for the Lord, and he will save you. Proverbs 21, verse 7, the violence of the wicked will destroy them because they refuse to do justice. Proverbs 21, verse 12, the righteous God wisely considers the house of the wicked, overthrowing the wicked for their wickedness. Proverbs 21, verse 18, the wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. All those verses showing that in the end, and those are just packed together in two chapters in Proverbs, in the end, God overtakes the wicked and they get their just due. We just need to treat them as kindly as we can and let him have his due course. In the book of Revelation, which is an apocalyptic book about persecution, there are seven churches to whom the book is addressed. Churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Each of those particular churches gets a few words from the Lord himself in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And they all wind up with a promise for those who overcome. Just listen. Revelation 2 verse 7 to the church at Ephesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. See the imagery from the Garden of Eden, the tree of life in the paradise of God. Man can't get to that literally anymore, but in heaven, it's pictured as being there in Revelation 21 and 22. You overcome, I'll give you to eat of that. You'll have life. Revelation 2 verse 11 to the church at Smyrna. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. That's the lake of fire, eternal condemnation, according to Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Revelation 2, verse 17, to the church at Pergamos. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. See the imagery back to the way God provided for the Israelites in the Old Testament. And I will give him a white stone. Purity is white. Strength is a stone. I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it, indicating they will be very special. Revelation 2, 26 to 28, to the church at Thyatira. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. That's a prophecy about the way Christ would eventually take over all kingdoms in a sense not challenging their physical authority, but he would have a spiritual kingdom that would reign over all. And then, as I also received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. And then Revelation 3, verses 5 and 6, to the church at Sardis. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess him before my father and before his angels. The person who overcomes will not be blotted out of the book of life. The person who overcomes will have Jesus saying to the Father in front of the angels, yes, I know him, I know her, let them in. And then to the person who overcomes, the church at Philadelphia in Revelation 3, verses 12 and 13. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And Revelation 3, 21 and 22, to the church at Laodicea. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Christ overcame his sufferings and sat down at the right hand of God. He promises to those who suffer on his behalf that if they overcome, they'll be with him on his throne. In all of that beautiful imagery, what it amounts to is heaven with God. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Can you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the word that you've given us, for Jesus as an example. We're so saddened and sorry that the world is so hateful towards people who try to do what's right. But we pray if that happens to us, you help us to stand strong, help us to be prepared and be ready. And we pray that we pray that we'll be able to overcome, and be with you in home in heaven. Father, we pray that you'd be with those who are persecuted violently, governmentally around the world right now, that they would have relief from their persecution, that they would be able to live their lives in peace and then go to heaven. But if that not be your will, please give them strength. Father, we pray for freedom to spread so that people wouldn't have such problems. We know there's always going to be some problems because Jesus said there would be, his apostle said there would be. 
We just pray that you give us the strength for whatever might come. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and all you've given us through him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that concludes our study of the Beatitudes. We'll go a different direction away from the Sermon on the Mount uh, this coming Sunday. If you'd like to join us, we'll uh, start at 11 o'clock Sunday morning and then 5 o'clock Sunday afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, and you have a good night.